Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to our first Clips with the Coalition. And the purpose of this is to talk about um, culture change and um, just giving you short snippets of culture change because we all know we're in a busy society and a lot of us only have about five to oh, 10 wow. I'm having a big set. Five to 10 minutes that we need to um, watch videos in. So our very first topic today is going to be the power of words. And one of the things that I want to point out is that this can be used in any setting. It can be used if you're living in a nursing home, if you're living in assisted living facility, if you are living in a hospice home, if you have hospice coming into your own home. Um, you can use this with your family, if you're out at restaurants, if you're out in um, the mall. This applies to every single one of us, regardless of your age, whether you're a child or whether you're an older adult. And some people may not like that word as well. Um, I haven't decided yet if I'm an older adult or if I'm going to remain a young adult for the rest of my life. And I prefer the young adults. So um, so why is um, person first language impor important? It's because we want people to see us who we are. We want people to see our elders as who they are. We do not want them to see them as a disease or a diagnosis. And so a couple examples that I'm going to throw out at you is when an individual has a Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, they are not inflicted with Alzheimer's. They are living with Alzheimer's or they're living with the Alzheimer's diagnosis. We know that people who have any type of dementia diagnosis can still learn, be productive, um, can do so many things. Just because they have this diagnosis doesn't mean that they can no longer do that. Stroke survivor, stroke victim. A lot of times people use the word stroke victim but they've actually survived a stroke. They can do so many more things that stroke does not define them of who they are. We can still learn from them. We can still interact with them. They can still learn new tasks, new games, new whatever it may be. Wheelchair, that's one of my pet peeves. They're wheelchair bound. Are they really wheelchair bound or are they using a wheelchair to get around? And I would like to look at it as they need a wheelchair to get from point A to point B. And so those are just a few examples that I'm going to give. Does anybody else on this call um, have an example that they would like to use? Kelly, do you have an example that you would like to share? Sure. Um, one of the things that um, we use a lot of times is that the patient refused or the patient is non-compliant. Um, although we preach that our patient or our resident or our elder has rights um, and they have the right to refuse treatment, they have a right to refuse to go to the hospital, they have a right to refuse their medications. And so um, we need to change our wording around that just because someone doesn't want to take their medication or doesn't want to follow the recommended diet does not make them non-compliant. They're just choosing their care. They're participating in their care and, and they're allowed to do that. So we really need to change the verbiage around that um, to maybe, you know, the resident chooses to do this or the resident chose not to do that um, instead of labeling them as non-compliant. We all know we see that non-compliant um, come across in a referral or something like that. And it really um, puts a, a label on that person. It, it's not a, a positive label, it's a negative label um, because non-compliant you know, surfaces around, well, we can't get them to do what we want them to do. 
Um, it's not about us. It's about, you know, what that resident patient elder wants. And so we really need to reframe the way we think about that. And we we want them, we say, we want them to participate in their care. We want, we give resident-centered care. We have resident-centered care plans and person-directed care, but yet we we give them a negative label when they when they want to participate in their care or make choices regarding their care. So that is one that kind of really uh, sits rough with me once in a while. And I've really tried as a nurse to kind of change my theory, theory and thinking away around that. And also the way that I chart it, because that's not, I wouldn't want someone to say that about me. So. I wanted to mention real quickly the word facility. That is a word I hear a lot working in this industry and it makes it sound so institutional. No one wants to live in a facility or an institution. Um, this is their home. So I'm um, using a word like facility really makes it sound like there's some place where they don't wanna be. So we try and use words like community and, and much more home-like words, so. And, and I want to build off of what Kelly was talking about. I think um, I think one of the reasons that refused comes up um, <laughs> or non-compliant comes up is because we love to put the word order into everything. The doctor ordered this, so you must take it. And I find it really fascinating because when I go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't order things. He recommends things and he prescribes things. And I have complete choice to do it or not do it when I leave. But somehow you go into a nursing home and now everything the doctor says is in order, which I find really interesting because then that negates us from having to negotiate with the person, to have to educate them about what they're getting. I mean, think of how that word frees us up from all of our responsibilities as healthcare professionals to really make sure they understand what they're getting and how they're getting it. So I don't like the word order at all. I think that gets us into this, now they're non-compliant, now they're refusing because it was in order. And I think we should call it what it is, a recommendation, a prescription. Yep. Well, and how many of us like to take an order? You'd order me to do something. Nah, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> Kirsten. You know, uh, I guess I'll just chime in on that same topic. And it, it seems like, you know, if you or I were to go to the doctor and they were to say, hey, Kirsten, you could stand to lose a few pounds, uh, you know, and they would make a recommendation for diet or exercise or those kinds of things. When you become a resident or a client or a patient or any of those, again, those are all terms that we use. And what we're doing is we're taking away people's rights when we're saying that those things become an order and and it's not fair they still need to be given that choice and the dignity and respect to do things that are both good for them as well as bad for them simply because you you are receiving support or services does not mean that you don't get a say in in the care that you are receiving And all of this type of communication that we're talking about right now, let's talk about how individuals communicate with our precious individuals here. There comes that elder speak. So Jeffrey, how about you and I role play? We're gonna say Jeffrey's my resident, I'm his nurse. Oh, hi Jeffrey, you look so nice today, but we need to finish putting on your shoes because we don't want you to have a fall again. You remember what happened that last time? Really dissect how I just communicated that, everyone. It's almost like that pattern of speech, that specialized speech that I was patronizing mm -hmm. my precious person here. And how is Jeffrey going to respond to me? Jeffrey, go ahead. How are you gonna to respond to me? I'm your nurse. What are you gonna tell me? Uh, I'm probably going to challenge you and wonder if maybe the reason I had some of those issues weren't brought on by you instead of just me. <laughs> exactly. And you've heard us talk on this call so far about words such as refuse, behaviors. Could it be from just my voice alone and the manner in which I communicate it? So disrespectful. So we encourage everyone to be thoughtful in your speech. 
be articulate. It doesn't mean you talk down, you talk with. And when I hear people speak loud, like, hi, Teresa, how are you? It's like, why are you raising your voice like that? Well, because we think they're older, not my terms, everyone. We have that preconceived notion. Just wanted to add that. Elders speak, everyone. And there's so much research that shows anymore how that is uh, evident in their resistance to CARES. It also has been shown to increase behaviors. Excellent. Kirsten, you had something to add? Uh, Anna, no truer words have ever been said. And, you know, the other piece that I think we have to really be cognizant of is what staff are saying amongst each other and how they are discussing those that they are supporting. First of all, we never know who's listening, but even if they aren't listening, we need to watch what our words are saying about that person. Um, one that I often see is describing people by their behavior. Um, unfortunately, this is something that happens over and over again. And, you know, making sure that when we are we're talking about people again, it comes back to dignity and respect. I would not want someone to describe me at something I did at one point in time that is probably a, one of the worst things that I could have done. And I don't want someone to consistently describe me in that manner. Um, so I think we really need to be very careful about not describing people by behavior, but talking about them as we would want to be talked about um, with other professionals that are supporting us. You bring up another good point of how we communicate with the individual is not only their behavior, but not talking to them because of their diagnosis. So if we know they have a da Alzheimer's disease, it does not give you the right to automatically talk down, talk higher pitch, or even slower in your speech because we think they are cognitively impaired. It's all about that labeling. Absolutely. Anybody have anything else you want to add? I just quickly want to add that um, as we start to do more of these clips with the coalition, to know that none of us are perfect at this. We are all learning. Um, I think it was during my presentation, I used the word, I think, industry. Well, are we really an industry or are we professionals caring for people? And I think there was another word that I misused that you may have picked up on. And I probably picked up on it right as it fell out of my mouth. And so let's not beat each other up if we're using language. Let's simply point it out to each other so that we can grow and learn. That's all I had to add, Denise. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you for letting us share what we think um, are important things to be thinking about with person first language. Always put the person first. Um, and yes, the language we're telling ourselves in our heads, as well as the language we're sharing with each other, regardless of who that is, influences how we believe, what we think, what we assume, and therefore our actions. So it may seem trivial to change language, but it's very powerful language will change people's actions and that helps you get closer to person-centered care which is what we are all striving for and what we all want as we age so thank you for joining us for clips with the coalition we'll see you next time <laughs>